Thank you everybody for coming to this book event with Elizabeth Becker, the author of You Don't Belong Here, which is a gripping and fascinating and unputdownable account of three journalists and photographers who covered the Vietnam War. I'm really happy to welcome you here on behalf of the program that I run, which is the Technology, Media, and Communications Specialization at the School of International and Public Affairs, the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia, the Columbia Journalism School, and SIPA's working group on conflict resolution. So we're all really pleased to have you here, Elizabeth. And we've got um, students, alumni, working journalists, and other members of the Columbia community in the audience. Um, so thanks everybody. And Elizabeth, I think you were probably going to start by showing some slides, is that correct? Did you wanna say, say anything before you begin? Only to say um, it's wonderful to be here. Columbia is a special place for me. I've already introduced my son-in-law who's a professor here and my daughter just completed her graduate studies in the journalism school here. So. It's a special place and thank you for having me. Um, so yes, I'd like to start um, a brief presentation with the, um, this is the book, You Don't Belong Here. The three women who I profile as the three women who rewrote the story of war, that is they reframed it, are at the top, Catherine Leroy, a French photojournalist who like the other three arrived on a one way, to, on paying their own way to Vietnam. She flew from Paris to Saigon. She had zero experience as a photographer. She was in her mid twenties. It was 1966. She was a, essentially a high school dropout, yet by her, um, her own work and her outsider's view of a, sort of a humane look at photography, she took amazing photographs and became the first woman to win the uh, uh, George Polk Award for Photography and the Robert Kappa Gold Medal Award, which is the thing for a, a you know, conflict reporter. The next woman down is Frances Fitzgerald, an American. She is the most privileged by a long shot of my three women. She's of a blue blood wasp background intellectual uh, family of wealth and prestige. Her dad was a CIA director. Her mother was a, a Democratic Party activist and socialite. She arrived on her own, no job, with a couple of ideas for freelancing. And she ended up taking a completely different view of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, looking at the Vietnamese point of view, the Vietnamese history, the landscape, the culture and the people and what the war was doing to it. Her work eventually led to her to writing Fire in the Lake, the Vietnamese and the Americans in Vietnam, which was won every award possible in 1972. She was 31 years old. The bottom is an Australian, Kate Webb, family of intellectuals. She was born in New Zealand and raised in Australia. She arrived <clears throat> again on her own nickel with her typewriter, no credentials to speak of, no job, no leads on a job. Yet she too, um, as an outsider, worked a very different path for combat reporters. She became a great combat reporter really burrowing into the societies of the Cambodians and the um, Vietnamese, telling a story that had a human dimension that the others hadn't. And her contributions were recognized in, the, in a prize named after her, the Kate Webb Award to the Asian journalist um, with the greatest determination and courage in um, journalism. Next slide, please. This is Catherine Loire, the French photographer. Now my book is not filled with a lot of analysis of gender this or gender that. It's, I tell the story as it's lived by the women and they lived big, big lives. Catherine was already an accomplished pianist and an accomplished a parachutist when she arrived in Saigon. And she was the only journalist, it turns out, 
male or female photographer or writer or reporter who was qualified to jump with the 173rd Brigade in the only air assault of the war. Look at her. She's barely five feet tall. She weighs about 87 pounds. She's equipped, her equipment almost overtakes her. She's got three cameras around her neck. Um, my husband, who's, who's an accomplished parachutist like this and a, and a veteran, said that he can't believe she could jump and the cameras didn't fly in her face. But she did jump. And next slide, please. While she jumped, she, she took these amazing photographs. Mm -hmm. This is Katrine taking photographs with those three cameras while she's jumping into a combat zone. She lands and she writes in her um, diary that it was the softest landing she ever had. And she, she was used to, to jumping over the Burgundy um, countryside. Uh, needless to say, that photograph has been reproduced everywhere. Next slide, please. This is one of her iconic photographs. She, as I said, she's small, petite, tiny, whatever you want to use. So she used her, her size and her, her almost acrobatic abilities to get as close as she could to her subjects, even in the middle of combat. So this is uh, a 20 year old medic named Vernon Wickey. This is one of the great battles. You can see the, the desolation of the battleground one of the great battles and she is crawling in the mud getting close enough to take these in a series of other pictures as he tries to save a soldier the soldier dies he cries out in anguish which is what you see there then he picks up the soldier's rifle and goes to try to kill the um the vietnamese on the other side who had injured and and killed his comrade it, it's so close that the medic couldn't believe she was even there. She, he didn't see her. He said, where was she? I didn't see her. And she was this close to him. Next slide, please. And that's her, her um, sort of her MO. Here's um, a soldier in the classic position of waiting, alert, ready. And she, you can see it in his eyes see it in the way he's um, posturing. All of her, she, she had a gift that um, Horst Foss, the great AP bureau chief said, he hadn't seen since World War II. Her photographs were um, stunning and they were on the cover of magazines like Life and Look and Perry Match. Next slide, please. And of course, the civilians. She was adept at catching that moment as the battles proceed and policies force villagers out of their homes, you know, that their ancestors, that the generations had lived in, they have close to nothing. They're on the road, barefoot, not sure where they were going. Next slide, please. Now, this is Frances Fitzgerald, her press card. As I said, she came with a lot of privilege, a lot of connections, and that was used against her. People thought, well, she's got it made. She's got her money. She's got all her connections. She can just get easy, easy, easy stories, but she didn't. She did the opposite. She did the hardest kind of reporting and the kind of reporting no one else was doing. She went she would go to the battlefield, not as often by a long shot as the men, but she would then, after battlefield, for instance, go to the civilian hospital to see how the civilians were taken care of. In her privileged life, she had never seen anything like what these people were going through. The hospital, the smell, the noise, and she recorded it all. She wrote it down. Then, for instance, when she was trying to tell the story of, of how this was this all this damage and hurt was not helping the American cause. She did things like <clears throat> go and spend a lot of time in one village alone to write a long piece for the New York Times um, called <clears throat> The Life and Death of the Village. Next slide, please. And because I showed you all of um, Katrine's pictures, I wanted to, to read you a little bit from that magazine article. This is 1966. The United States has only been at war for one year and already she was zeroing in on the problems. She writes, from our helicopter, the land looks sculpted. 
by a history as constant as the motion of water. But in the military parlance, the village is insecure, isolated by war. The American and South Vietnamese armies with the radio, the trucks and the airplanes have altered the villagers sense of time and space. Their very numbers and the vast power of their machines have distorted the human proportion and the scale of possibilities. For the villagers still work with hand pulleys and bullet carts. They've uprooted farmers, pushing them over the edge of their old lives and onto the road to swell the tide of people washing wave upon wave out of the seething war. In combination with the Viet Cong, they have brought poverty, terror, and suspicion. But above all, they have brought uncertainty. One year into the war. Next slide, please. As I said, she wrote the book that in 1972, won the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, <clears throat> and the Bancroft History Award. No, no book about the war, Vietnam War has repeated that accomplishment. And as I said, here, she took the, um, she filled a void. She showed the American um, public what the war looked like from the Vietnamese point of view, something that, um, for which she was rewarded. Here's an, here's an example from the book. The masses of Vietnamese people resented the French no more and no less than they resented the Americans. I'll just say the French, of course, were the colonists who came before them. It was the Viet Minh who focused that resentment. The fact was that many Vietnamese of the cities had wanted the Americans to intervene, had wanted them to intervene, not only for practical reasons, but for the psychological ones. They wanted the Americans to be the all-powerful barbarians to take responsibility for the war at the same time they feared American domination. By one of those strange reverses that the mind makes for the sake of self-consistency, both the desire and the fear merged in the expression of fear that the Americans would leave them. The more Americans spent their best efforts and their lives in Vietnam, the less influence they had to reform the government of South Vietnam. With both men and material resources, the Americans were enforcing corruption and destroying the tissue of Vietnamese society. A stunning, stunning work. Next slide, please. And here's Kate Webb, the Australian. Um, you can see from just her manner, uh, she, she burrowed in on the story, the people, she gave her full attention, her full intelligence. Now, um, she arrived thinking she could cover the Australian army. Well, the Australians had the same rule against women covering it on the battlefield as the Americans did, but the Australians actually enforced it. And the Americans had been convinced not to enforce it in Vietnam for many reasons, one of which was that a few women before them, before Kate, including Catherine Lois, had convinced them to just suspend it, let the women stay in the field as long as they didn't have it, cause any problems. And as it turned out, that suspension became permanent. And these women effectively um, opened the way for women of the future to cover the war. So Kate made her name, first of all, always, always as a, free, she was a freelancer, just as Frankie was, just as Katrine was. But Kate made it at, in 1968, in January, at the beginning of the Tet Offensive, which I'll remind everyone was a turning point of the war. This January 68, the President of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, and General Westmoreland, William Morrison, Westmoreland, who was in charge of the troops in Vietnam. Everyone had promised light at the end of the tunnel. They could see an American victory. Instead, on Tet, the Lunar New Year, the Vietnamese, both the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, launched a, a, a countrywide, South Vietnamese-wide uprising, <clears throat> attack, not, a, excuse me, an attack. And to the horror of Americans back home, it included breaking into and taking over one floor of the US Embassy. Kate, as a freelancer, was one of the first one there. 
and she wrote a dispatch that made her name. She said, the embassy looked like a, uh, a butcher shop in Eden. Her dispatch, her reporting, and even her photographs were on the front pages of around the world, and she finally got a job with United Press International. And she showed a flair for the humane approach, what we would now call human rights, which the other two did as well. That was very much the outsider's point of view, less even in combat, it wasn't all bang, bang. And um, next slide, please. Here's an example from her. This is a UPI report, a, a wire service. That means she writes it in a day. There's, there's no thinking. She, and this is old fashioned time. Uh, where you dict she probably dictated this, or maybe she was in Saigon, but you write this very quickly. This is called Life and Death of a Helicopter Crew, <clears throat> Tain in 1968. Okay. There are times when the Vietnam War makes a reporter's fingers shake while holding a pencil. My pencil wobbles as I write the story of two young helicopter gunners I knew briefly as Smitty and Mac. I saw them go to war many times. Now I have seen their bodies come back. Indeed, the days before that Thursday, I rode with them as they flew out again and again over the jungles. They lived the ordeal of those military words, resupply, medevac, close fire support, troop lift. It was a special routine of life and death. It started each time with the pilot stick coming up, the door gunner's visor sliding down over their eyes, high over the green jungle wind, te tears at your clothes and flattens your face. The impersonal army report saying the helicopter crashed and burned, all four crew members killed in action. I promise you, you didn't see many articles that brought tears to your eyes in the first three graphs like that one. Next slide, please. Oh, we've already gone through. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, Kate was so good that when the United States invaded Cambodia in 1970, spreading the war to that country, she was named Deputy Bureau Chief of the new Phnom Penh Bureau. Within a few <clears throat> months, her Bureau Chief was killed and she was named the Bureau Chief herself. This was extraordinary. Very few women were even um, in Vietnam or in Cambodia as full-time reporters, much less as a Bureau Chief. But because of the culture of the time, there was no press release. Nobody wanted to point out that a woman, in fact, was doing it. And Kate was as cautious as anybody else. It was so rare for women to be doing what they were doing. They figured that if they kept their profile low, nobody would notice and they would get back. And in those days, most women, in fact, were um, still being relegated to the women's sections of newspapers. Well, Kate's luck ran out and in 1971, she was captured by the North Vietnamese in Cambodia. She was captured and held for 23 days. And um, while she was held, it was falsely reported that uh, her body had been found and she was declared dead. Her friends and family were, um, you know, obviously in mourning. Her sister, of course, didn't believe it. And um, she, um, she held out all hope. So while everybody was worried that Kate was dead, in fact, Kate was undergoing a tremendous captivity. She, the food was lousy. They had to eat exactly what the North Vietnamese soldier ate, which was pretty bare bones, um, rice and, uh, and gruel and tea. And she walked a lot. She was, she was sick. The medical care was awful. And um, yet she still kept her, um, her sense of humor and they, all managed to, to memorize a lot of what they saw and figure out how to take notes. So I thought one of her best things from her memoir, which she wrote called On the Other Side, 23 Days Being Held. Um, here's what it was like when she was in, interrogated by her North Vietnamese captured, who believed she was a spy. I mean, what was a, you know, a woman doing on the road? So here's what, here, how it goes. 
why did you choose that particular morning to go down Highway 4? The North Vietnamese ask. Kate says, I wished I hadn't in a way. On the other hand, it's given me the first opportunity of my life to meet you. The government announced the operation. It was my job to see what was really happening. North Vietnamese, we find it unbelievable that you would go down the highway, which is very dangerous, alone in your car, just looking for the truth. She answers, that made it sound pretty silly, looking for a rare flower on the battlefield. Everyone knows there's no truth on the battlefield except getting killed, getting out alive, and the unenviable in-between of being maimed. Sometimes I think my job is crazy myself, I said ruefully. Next slide, please. But she got out. She became a legend overnight. The Australian, the Australian country went crazy. Every newspaper had huge headlines that looked like the end of World War II. Kate's alive, Kate's free, Kate's wonderful. She, after she finished her work, she flew back to, to um, Sydney to be with her family for a short break. And she and her brother, um, her brother, who was, who was a journalist at the time, brought her to the forever all-male um, correspondence club in Sydney, and she crashed it. And here she is, um, taking great delight in being the first woman ever to have a drink at the correspondence club. Um, she went on to, um, to do continued work and was in Hong Kong when I arrived. Next slide, please. Uh, through through a um, through a mutual friend, Kate met me at the airport. Um, here's my press card from long ago, and um, to make sure I got on the right plane, in my backpack I had um, Frankie Fitzgerald's book, of course, Fire in the Lake, and I literally was following in their footsteps. And but I was covering a different war. Next slide, please. This was Cambodia. Looks a lot different than, than the pictures you saw Katrine took. These are monks. Um, this is a <clears throat> smaller, a different kind of Buddhism than you had in, in Vietnam. And it was, a, it was a more homogeneous in that sense. It was a country completely unprepared for war. It had been neutral throughout this Vietnam War from 55 until 1970 um, when uh, the war did break out. Uh, the previous ruler had tried, Prince Norodom Singh, had tried to keep it neutral, playing one side off against the other. Finally, it broke. And as I said, the American invasion started. The Vietnam, North Vietnamese refused to leave and instead spread out. And by the time I got there, um, the war was, was um, scare, frightening. It was lethal. The Paris Peace Accords had already been signed. And the American Air Force was free to bomb Cambodia. So I, I, I watched the bombing. I covered the bomb, carpet bombing of Cambodia. And Kate came back from Hong Kong to teach me a lot about the ropes. And um, <clears throat> so I, and I literally lived the kind of life that these women did. I came on my own, my one-way ticket, had to find a job, uh, lived, lived pretty, pretty, poorly until after a few months, I became um, the Washington Post stringer, which is a contact, contract reporter on the ground and Newsweek. In those days, there were very few um, full-time staff reporters in Cambodia. I think you can count them on one hand. So um, Washington Post and Newsweek needed someone like me and, and, um, and that's how I broke in. Next slide, please. And this is one of those sad pictures that sort of epitomizes um, a lot of the war. Um, there was corruption in Cambodia as well. So the government's so army was replete with, with the young kids wearing shower sandals, poor, poor pay grade. Um, and uh, like the others, I, I went through stages of wondering if I could handle all of the sexual harassment, wonder if I could um, turn the other cheek when it came to um, misbelieving, uh, wondering whether or not I was um, 
everything that was happening to me uh, was uh, I could I could still prevail. I remember one of the worst things was when I did start to do well. Um, some anonymous reporters uh, wrote a parody about me on Reuters stationery, where they um, more or less stated quite openly that the only reason I was doing well was because I was using my feminine wiles. Now that, that's part of the um, the era I was in and the era that these women in. Next slide, please. Um, these women came when the women's liberation was barely um, a, 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 a movement back in the United States. They were, um, if anybody showed that they actually believed there were institutional obstacles to women's advancement, um, then we will, they, uh, they, uh, they made fun of you and said you were looking for a crutch. So um, that's one of the reasons I, that's the one theme I have in my whole book. It says outsiders, that these women rewrote the story of war. It's not because of X or Y chromosomes. It's because they had fresh, fresh eyes. They had different ways of life and um, they expanded the con conception of war that you, there, were, there was a more humane to, way to write it and especially to write about the countries where the war was taking place in. So that's who they are and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Elizabeth, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I think one thing I really enjoy is seeing the photos and the text because you give a flavor of how compelling and dramatic their coverage was. Um, I think in a way, you're all, the, the story that you tell is really an extraordinary story and you're always so modest about what you've done, but you've really told for the first time a piece of history of women's of women in journalism, you know, as you mentioned, we all we all remember Martha Gellhorn and a few big names. But I myself worked in Vietnam in the 1990s. I've read tons of books about Vietnam by many of the journalists, you know, the David Halberstams and the Neil Sheehan's, and I actually didn't know any of this at all. So the story you're telling, I think, is really phenomenal and important, and makes a huge contribution. Um, another thing that you convey so thoroughly in the book is the incredible um, trauma and stress that these women suffered from, mm -hmm. so that they took the toll, the emotional and psychological toll that it took on them. Mm -hmm. And another thing I hadn't known is how terrible the men were to them, how jealous they were, how they tried to undermine them, how they tried to get them fired. Um, you know, we thought a lot of the male reporters were pretty awful when we lived in Vietnam in the 90s, but there are real villains um, in this book, as well as heroines. I mean, obviously, Horst Foss, the famous AP editor, I didn't know how supportive he was, but the destruction um, that the that the many of the sort of, yeah, the male journalists and one of the other entertaining things about the book is you talk about their love lives and their personal relationships. And, um, you know, some of the men that these women were involved with do not come off that very well. Um, I won't maybe say who, because people should rush out and read the book. Um, and another thing I just wanted to add was that everybody I know who's gotten hand a hold of the book has read it in about two days. I, I might tore through it. I see people in the audience are nodding. This is the most, it's a serious piece of research, but it's an unbelievably gripping uh, book as well. So really congratulations for your storytelling and, and, and um, just, yeah, the story that you told and the way that you told it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, just to add on the on the love life and things, I also have their family. I mean, they write to their parents and and they write to their friends. And so I I wanted the full life because that's what I always find missing from any war memoir, but especially to understand the toll you that that it took. For instance, I had to include what they told their parents. And just a short one. I remember when Katrine was just beginning to realize that her, her, the male photographers were trying to get her thrown out of the country. She wrote back to her mother and said, 
you know, they're bastards and so on and so forth. But she said, you know, mom, here, women are viewed either as a wife or a whore. And these women were trying to be professionals and they, there's not a lot of space for them. So anyway, thank you, Anya. Not at all. I think we're all bursting with questions. Mackenzie's put one in the chat and Laura had one as well. Should we start with Laura Nettlefield and then, and then yep, yep, yep. question? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Anya. Congratulations, Elizabeth. It's, it's really a wonderful book and I encourage all of you to go out to book culture and pick up your copy if you haven't done so already. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about the process and your sources, because it is such a gripping narrative and a page turner, and there's so much rich detail and quotes. Could you just speak a little bit about the, the source material and how you decided what to keep? Did you unco uncover or have any challenges um, in getting access to the source material? Just expand on that a little bit. Okay. Um, the problem... Well, first of all, I had a huge advantage that you know I lived it, so I knew where to look, and and I could read the material and know what was important, what wasn't, and so just start there. I had a big leg up. Secondly, um, it took me a while to figure out how I was going to do it. There's no question. Um, once I did a lot of research about everyone about the whole context, about what the laws were, what the bans were. I had to do an entire, you know, whole contextual before I could narrow it down to the three women. And then um, once I threw in, I need a photographer, it all fell into place. Kate Webb was clearly the combat reporter. Frankie Fitzgerald was clearly the long form. I mean, they had head and shoulders. And then, you know, of course it had to be Katrine Lois for, um, for photography. So, I mean, there were just such outstanding women that um, a couple of people have asked about one person or another person, but these three were the outstanding. And so then, so then I, how, what were my source materials? Well, um, it, I lucked out on this one too. Uh, Kate Webb, left everything to her sister and brother. And her sister was beside her all the way. Um, she had a, a really tragic childhood and her parents were killed when she was 18. So her sister was family. And um, the uh, sister had everything of Kate's in plastic bins in a storage unit. So we, we flew to, my husband and I flew to Sydney and um, I spent, you know, lots of times with Rachel, the sister, and um, I, I found stuff and I said, Rachel, you know what this is? And she says, no. And I said, well, these are these and these. So we, it was wonderful and fully cooperating. And then interviewing Rachel and her brother, Jeremy, they were open. Um, they wanted their sister's story told every aspect. So the hardest stuff that she'd never talked about, they knew that Kate's story needed to be told. So that was wonderful. Katrine and oh, and I'm preceded by saying Kate died in um, when she, her early 60s, and Katrine had died about the same time in her early 60s. She had no family to speak of. Her mother died shortly afterwards, so it was her friends, and you know, God bless friends like this, who um, of the great photographer, um, the great head of Contact Press Image, Robert Pledge, and um, David Burnett, Dominique Deschanel. They collected money to make a foundation, a French foundation, Dotation Catherine Roy, and collected everything, her photographs, her papers, and everything. And they were scattered to the winds. They're still discovering stuff. And they made it all available to me. And they wisely had, had done some um, video interviews of, of her contemporaries when she died. So I was able to use those as well. Then Frankie is alive. She is um, a, an incredibly smart, astute, reserved woman. And she had early on given her papers to Boston University. Mm -hmm. She gave them everything. I mean, it was a gold mine. And she couldn't remember what she'd given. And whenever I ran across something, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, and I'd ask her a question, she would answer. So uh, she has such a respect for history. Um, that um, she never steered me wrong. She didn't, it, there was one point where I was stuck because it was so boring writing about her writing a book. 
I mean, what is more boring than writing a book? Going to the library, coming home, signing a letter, coming. And so I said, did you have a boyfriend there then? And she said, oh yes, Alan Lelchuk, the, the novelist. So I find Alan and I have some, and he, it's fabulous. Suddenly the that section is alive. So it's a lot of it was that, but as I said, it really helped that I knew the people they knew. I knew their friends. I, I, you know, I was not, I did not go in cold at all. I came as a, you know, insider. Sometimes I felt like, you know, the narrator who's just basically off screen, but, you know, knew what was going on. So that helped. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> That's you. Um, shall we, I'll read, Mackenzie Crow has an interesting question in the chat here. She's asking, uh, when you learned uh, more about the stories of these women, uh, was this largely validating of your experiences with sexism, harassment, and barriers during your time as a reporter? Were there any surprises when you were researching this book? Oh, yes, I was. Um, the best example, I think, is Katrine. She had it worse because she was a photographer in the field all the time. You couldn't be a war photographer without being in the field. And that was the greatest um, challenge to masculinity, to see this little, this small woman um, just running circles around the men, because this was supposed to be male territory. Women are not supposed to be there. And uh, <clears throat> these are the, uh, the, the head of Agence France Press led a group of other journalists, most of them anonymous, and military spokesmen who created a, a, what they called a black file, a military file to discredit her and take away her press credentials, which, is, which would have meant she had to leave the country. And um, they accused her of things like being coarse, being vulgar, being unwashed, you know, being pushy, uh, being arrogant. You know, those are you know the general description of any journalist, but um, they used that to um, to take away her credentials, and it, it worked temporarily. But she fought back, and um, after that, uh, she was very determined to do well. Uh, I I mean I was shocked. There I I had never come even close to that. Although then I remembered that um, like one of my best friends in Cambodia, the woman who brought me who helped bring me out there because she was there, Silvana Foa, um, she wrote, um, an, she did an investigation and wrote a piece about um, how the US was illegally helping in the bombing of Cambodia. And she was thrown out, just like that. About a week or so later, Sidney Schamberg of the New York Times wrote about essentially the same story and nothing happened to him. You know, oh, he wrote a great story, wonderful. And, and, the, and so I was witnessing already the very different treatment of women and men, sometimes institutionally, sometimes professionally. Okay. Uh, Lydia had a question next and she's having technical difficulties. So I will speak for her. Um, and Lydia, thank you if I'm pronouncing that right, I hope. She says, hearing you speak about the harassment women face then, I see parallels to, to today. Although very different mediums today, studies are showing female reporters facing more harassment on social media. Do you see any lessons, advice from the brave women you write about that female reporters can apply in the current environment? Oh, I'm not very good at lessons, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I've left them out of the book and I don't know if I, the one thing that, um, that was, was amazing, and I'll use Kate. Um, she pushed everything aside. She she was a diplomat. She wanted to get her career. She could ignore stuff. She knew how to avoid the worst of this, the guys. But then, and she thought she'd figured a way around all of this. But then um, it hit her like a whammy right after the war, when she should have been recovering from all of the trauma, the PTSD. She was in. She was appointed to Singapore, the no, no fighting there. But instead of being able to continue her career, her boss demanded that she become his mistress. She refused and he filed a complaint on another charge and um, she quit journalism. The, the obstacle that she thought she had figured a way around. So she quit journalism for 10 years and didn't come back and then what she did, she joined a different, um, she joined Agence France Press rather than UPI. 
UPI. So um, that's one lesson that Kate learned. Thank you. Uh, Jada Bullen is going to ask the next question. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, it's been such a great talk. Um, so going reading through the book, I was also really gripped by how much um, sexism and belittlement, as you described the male colleagues put on Webb, Fitzgerald, um, and also you as well experienced that in Cambodia. And I was curious to know what were the ways, if there were any that you took to try to take care of yourself and preserve your mental health? And if um, you knew of any of the ways that the women in this book did that as well, and if there was any way that they um, supported each other or because of the nature of their work, they had to find uh, individual manners of accomplishing that. We weren't that conscious. We weren't that conscious of what was, I mean, we didn't, we didn't say, oh, we're going through X, Y, and Z. It just happened. We lived it. We didn't, we did we weren't thinking that way. And um, what I found amazing was that all of us had trouble taking vacations. And all of, I mean, it's amazing. We, we had a horrible time leaving the war because we had, we were so dedicated to that story and to that, those countries that we almost wrote the same words, all of us. I, I had to come back, I had to come back. And then when you, when you left, because you couldn't take, and I couldn't take it anymore, it was very hard to get over it. So um, I know that I went to a therapist when I got home and I know the others didn't. Um, I know that, that Katrine wrote that she couldn't cross the street in Paris without flipping out. And it was only when she got an assignment to go to New York to cover a music festival called Woodstock that she could relax. She hung out with some vets who were there. And I think that was sort of the beginning of her somewhat recovery, although it wasn't complete, but we were not, we weren't cognizant of all that. I mean. Elizabeth, I think you're absolutely right. Some of the men that I worked with um, in Vietnam are still suffering from PTSD as well as physical injuries. Cause of course journalists get, get shot at. Right. Absolutely right. Um, a woman said, I remember when I would come back, I never covered any war, thank God, but I remember whenever I would come back from a uh, leave in New York, I would lie awake with my jet lag and think, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. They're going to find out. I think it's really common for women to have imposter syndrome and be sure that, you know, they just got lucky and that's how they got their job and they can't actually do their job. You play, I think, self-doubt I think yeah. that is, a, is a way we undermine ourselves sometimes. Although I must say these three had a confidence levels that I admired a lot. They just did not, did not falter ever. They just, they just kept pushing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not that's, their problem, no. That's fantastic. Laura, I know you're gonna probably call on our next person. I'll, I'll meet myself, thank you. Alan McKierney. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, it's been referenced a little bit today in our, in our chats, but I'm really curious, there were certain sections um from each of these three women i think specifically speaking to the american cases where legislation the women were not allowed to be war reporters and then they you know made special exceptions and then they re-invoked that and then they, they it seemed like they went back and forth a handful of times on allowing women into war reporting and i'm curious moving into the future if you have any insights on did they use this as test cases where they like look we can never do something like this again like these women have proven that this you know these women and others have proven that these laws don't make any sense that this reporting is just as good if not better and more diverse than what we've had in the past you know how did the um how did those kind of rules inform the future landscape oh well after vietnam there was no more um, banning of women. After Vietnam, it was women were forever on the battlefield. Uh, so that, that was over. It, was, it took other countries a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But the next time the United States um, went to war was 1991 Gulf War. And by then, uh, the women that arrived, they were staff correspondents. They had wages, they had health insurance, they had equipment, they... Um, you know, they didn't think they got the same access as the men, but they were they were full time. They were war correspondents, and that's remained. Even Australia dropped it. So I think 
it took a while, but all, all, country, all countries now allow women on the battlefield. Um, uh, but, you know, the problem now is that the battlefield itself has become um, uh, more dangerous for reporters, male or female. I mean, it's now possible in many respects that um, you could say that journalists are targets. I mean, look at the story of um, Marie Colvin. She was targeted. And journalists are targeted, and they are captured. They're kidnapped for um, for ransom. They're I mean, they're killed. Um, it's um, it's a different problem entirely. But after Vietnam, those women didn't realize it, but um, they effectively ended the ban on uh, women in combat. But they didn't tell the story for thirty years. They kept it quiet because they were afraid it might be reimposed. And it was only um, 30 years when they did a collection of, of, of personal reminiscence in a lovely book called War Torn that they actually told their story. It was that scary that it might be reimposed, but it wasn't, it was never reimposed. Um, Elizabeth, so many questions. I know we have to uh, close out at seven, but I was wondering how optimistic do you feel about Me Too? Do you think things are, it's going to help change or do you think it's sort of a flash in the pan? <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Um, I, um, you know, it, it's inevitable. I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable. It's like, um, it reminds me of the beginning of the various stages of the women's movement where, um, you know, uh, some serious work on getting rid of institutional barriers was reduced to, um, oh, they're just burning bras. And um, the move, Me Too movement um, is more than a hashtag. It's that um, women do not, should not have to go through that sexual harassment in order to be the professionals or whatever that they want to be. So I, you know, there's no question it's serious. Is it, is it misused, et cetera, et cetera? I'm not gonna get into that, but it's, it's yeah, it's essential. I think we all feel really, we were just actually talking about this in class last week, how important the Me Too movement has been. And um, yeah, I think when we talk about sexual harassment and the, and the problems of, of women and the abuse, I think um, journalists don't always like to talk about what they face, but I, as, as you, as people have pointed out in this conversation, the harassment of um, journalists and black women and black women journalists is is really very serious. And now, of course, because of social media, it can happen in so many different places as well. So your book is also talking about a sort of earlier version in some ways of mm -hmm. that. Oh yeah, no question. Yeah, no. I, I, yeah. Hannah yeah. just sent out a all. all yeah. I apologize, I didn't know quite, I have Zoom on my phone, not on my desktop, so I didn't know if everyone saw that. But hi, thank you so much for for being here and for for sharing with us and Anya for putting on this. This is wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm curious from a war correspondent's perspective, um, how the Vietnam War in so many ways was this new, it was a new kind of warfare the United States was engaged in. It was a new kind of journalism there was photography and video of battles for the first time that were reaching a lot of people um, and shaping public opinion of the war. And today it's like, we almost have the opposite, of, opposite problem in some ways. It's like, there's, if you look for it, there's so much video coverage. There's, there's, there seems to be kind of, um, you can be kind of overwhelmed by the amount of content about some of the horrible things that are going on in the, in the world. And I guess I'm wondering, what you think from your perspective um, and the perspective of the journalists you covered, what from them, they, they kind of humanized these stories and they were sharing photos, but what do you think today needs to be done? Um, or do you think anything needs to be done to kind of um, continue to, to tell these stories in you know, a new cutting age way? Or is it just we need to tell them better or include more voices or I guess I'm just wondering what you think about the, the future of, of war correspondence. Well, I, I'll answer from a slightly different angle. Uh, one of the reasons that um, the Vietnam War was so well covered 
was because the American public wanted, was hungry for details. We were at war. Whenever the United States is at war, you get a lot of saturation coverage. Now the wars are not, they're the forever wars that are um, the American, you don't see the Americans fighting anymore. It's the Iraqis who's, who nobody can keep track of who's fighting in Syria. The Russians were doing this and the, you know. So one of the problems that you described of the scattered nature, you don't know where to find it, is the fact that the Americans aren't the focus. And the United States is the kind of country where if it's not America, we're not interested. And that's a general problem with all of our foreign coverage is that um, particularly the last four years of the Trump administration, my goodness, it seemed like foreign news was lost. Hopefully now with the Biden administration, there'll be a, there's, there's this breathing space and we can be more part of the world. But I think our, the problem we have is getting the American public and the American media, everybody to focus even when the United States is not the one fighting. And that's the way I would phrase it. That is helpful. Thank you so much. Yep. Do we have any final questions? Tanya, anything else? No, I was just chatting. Nina Alvarez from the Journalism School is here, and they've been um, a co-sponsor. So I just wanted to acknowledge Nina and say thank you so much for coming and for putting this together. Um, it's it feels sometimes you know it's so important for journalists to feel that the Journalism School is involved um, with their event. So it was it's really great that you were able to to join and and help promote this event. Um, Really fascinating discussion. Uh, again, we have copies of Book Culture and um, all of you are welcome to drop by and, and pick one up. And um, really wanted to thank Elizabeth Becker and all the co-sponsors and everyone for coming and for all the great questions. So congratulations again, you've had fantastic reviews, lots and lots of attention, and we just couldn't be happier about hosting you. Thank you very much to everybody. Well, thank you, Anya, and thank you all for coming and for asking these wonderful questions. It means a lot.